So I'm going to, um, to start with a very brief introduction about who we are and, uh, and then I will uh, jump into the, the real topic for this discussion. So uh, CR Wireless, we, we are building the Internet of Things. Uh, building innovative wireless solution is, uh, is really in our DNA. Uh, we have the wireless technology, we have the global team to deliver. And um, as a matter of fact, uh, today, um, I mean, to date, uh, we, have, uh, we have shipped more than 120 million uh, units, uh, M2M devices, that are running uh, on uh, more than 80 cellular wireless networks. So as the, um, as the Internet of Things grows, um, our vision remains that um, we will enable the, the connected world uh, with intelligent wireless solutions uh, so that uh, our customers can innovate and uh, make the world better, safer, a better, safer place going forward. So we are offering uh, uh, the broadest range, the broadest portfolio of wireless devices, including uh, 2G, 3G, 4G module, gateways, uh, seamlessly integrated with uh, our secure cloud and uh, wireless services. So taking a closer look to uh, a few technology enablers for the Internet of Things, I will start with the connectivity. It's, uh, it's really vital for the, uh, for the Internet of Things uh, applications and system to be designed for, I mean, to be interoperable, open for uh, communication links between them, and uh, uh, communication links between them while uh, maintaining the right level of security. And, uh, and one key element to achieve this is actually uh, using the widely available cellular wireless networks that, uh, um, that secure uh, a smooth uh, system deployment that are also offering a, a very, very good uh, maintenance um, solution for the long term and, uh, and also offering a very good quality of service. So, um, having, uh, having said that, of course, uh, what is controlling the access to the network is the SIM. And the industry really needs SIM that are suitable for the Internet of Things. So, I'm now going to speak a little bit about the SIM. The regular SIM have been designed for the mobile phone. And, uh, and clearly, these uh, regular SIMs are lacking the flexibility which is required for the Internet of Things. Flexibility, what kind of flexibility? Actually, the flexibility required to be able to address global deployment, uh, to be able to do remote management, uh, or even self-management. So what, uh, what a smart SIM brings actually is, uh, is quite interesting. In fact, a smart SIM is smart enough to, uh, to be able, to be capable to switch from one network to another one autonomously according to a set of uh, criteria that have been defined that could be quality of service or cost. So that's, that's really a, a very big difference with the, the regular SIMs. The, the other thing is that a SIM for the Internet of Things is, is like a component. It is soldered on in the device, you cannot remove it, and uh, the, the embedded uh, EUICC SIMs bring a, a new layer, an additional layer of flexibility. So what means remote SIM provisioning? Actually, remote SIM provisioning means that the SIM is uh, capable to, um, to be updated or to be uh, fed with a new operator SIM profile over the air while the SIM is embedded in the device and the device is already in the field. So 
that's, that's in essence what remote SIM provisioning is. So if we look at the, the picture, actually, when the device is deployed in the SIM power on, the SIM is uh, boot, bootstrap and uh, register on the network of the operator A. And then what is, uh, what is really interesting with the UICC is that eventually the device could switch to the network of the operator B thanks to the uh, EUICC enabled SIM. So really EUICC SIM are simplifying a lot the global deployment because with such capability, you can imagine that with just one SIM, you can really deploy your device everywhere in the world. You will choose after the fact the operators where your device is going to be, uh, uh, to be supported. The other thing is that for, for applications like a meter which is deployed in the field for many years, you are not, uh, you're, I mean the, the EUICC SIM is offering the possibility to renegotiate a contract to, to adjust the, the cost of your subscription uh, later on. So it enables really uh, flexibility uh, for the installed base. And uh, also the UICC is a, a very interesting alternative to the roaming in terms of cost efficiency. Last but not the least, the UICC technology is standardized. So it's not a pre proprietary uh, solution, it's standardized. And uh, since it is standardized, it is also very, uh, very clear. There is interoperability and, uh, and this, is, uh, this is really a good solution uh, for, I would say, general, uh, general deployment. Now moving forward to another technology enabler for the IoT. Uh, I'm going to, uh, to talk uh, at very high level, and maybe we'll have questions later on, about the LPWA. The 3GPP standardization body has, in, has uh, included in uh, the really 13 of the standard major enhancement of the GSM and the LTE air interfaces. And uh, actually this is, um, offering a new solution to connect devices that previously we were unable to connect through cellular wireless because of cost, because of power consumption in some, in some cases, or even for insufficient coverage condition. Um, I mean, this, uh, this LPWA solution is, uh, is bringing a solution to this, uh, to this problem. And to be more specific, the three flavors of LPWA that have been standardized by 3GPP are the ECGSM, which is an evolution of the GSM uh, air interface, and uh, the LTE CAT M and the LTE NB, also named NBIoT, uh, that are actually um, evolution of the LTE standard. So, if we look at the, the picture, so we have uh, a solution with uh, much lower power consumption, with extended coverage, and uh, also driving cost efficiency. So a few more words about that. In terms of power consumption, with LPWA, uh, connected water meter will be able to operate in the field during 10 years on battery. This is really a big breakthrough power consumption. The, the second one is uh, coverage. Here also very big breakthrough, improvement up to 20 dB. I mean, that's, that's really a very big change. It means that appliances that are installed deep in the basement of the buildings can now be connected with cellular wireless, with LPWA. The, the other thing is uh, cost efficiency. LPWA is driving cost efficiency in the sense that, well, obviously less power consumption means a smaller battery, it's cost reduction. Um, one SIM, I mean, one device, one module could address deployment worldwide, I mean, reducing the number of SKUs and, and so on. I mean, this is also driving cost efficiency. 
And uh, in essence, also, there has been some simplification in the, uh, I would say, the, the architecture of, uh, of the wireless device that are driving cost improvements. Last but not the least, these three flavors of LPWA that have been standardized by the 3GPP are actually leveraging existing cellular wireless networks. So no need to wait for a new network to be, to be deployed worldwide. This solution will leverage the existing network. There is, of course, small <coughs> software uh, upgrade to be done to, the, to some base station or some, some network, but it's minor things for uh, the uh, LTE-CAT-M in particular. Uh, a little bit more uh, upgrade needed for the NB-IoT, uh, since in some cases it will leverage the, the refarming of the 2G network, so in some cases very old 2G base, base station would have to be upgraded from the hardware standpoint but this is the existing network, meaning that it is ready for scalability, it is uh, ready for uh, very good maintenance on the long term, and uh, it, it will still uh, offer the, the quality of service that we know on the cellular wireless networks. It's, uh, it's ready now, actually, on uh, our cellular wireless booth at the Mobile World Congress this year, we have demoed the extended coverage capability of LTE CAT M. Uh, if we would have done the same with LTE CAT NB1, it would have provided the same result from that standpoint. And, uh, and just to mention that the year before, we had, uh, we had actually demoed uh, the um, improvement in terms of power consumption with these LPWA uh, technologies. So, just to, to conclude, um, well, with, uh, with CR Wireless designed to cloud solutions, all these technologies are integrated already, and, uh, and many other technologies actually are integrated in the device to cloud solution from uh, CR Wireless that you can discover uh, by visiting our website at crwireless.com. With that, Thank you very much uh, for the introduction, and thank you for to the audience for uh, your attention uh, this late in the day. So as we go through the presentation, uh, there are three parts to the presentation. The first part is of medium length, the second part is longer, and the third part is very short, one slide. So I'm letting you know what's coming. Uh, so we can pace our, all pace ourselves. So the topic of my presentation is 802.11 technology as part of 5G. So first we'll talk about 5G and give a little bit of the context around what 5G is, its structure, and how 802.11 will fit in. Then we'll focus more on the specific 802.11 technologies that are under development now I'll also, I can give a very brief uh, review of the currently deployed technologies, but that will be in about two sentences because we're kind of at, uh, uh, at a limited time. And then we'll talk about, uh, I want to just give you a reference about IEEE 5G efforts. So the first piece. So 5G, if you read... Uh, any tech news about mobile network evolution, you've seen presentations about 5G. 5G is the next step after 2, 3, 4, 5G. So what is the evolution of, of mobile networks? From a use case point of view, you can see on this chart that there are three primary new use cases that are targeted. The first is enhanced mobile broadband. Why enhanced mobile broadband? We have mobile broadband in LTE with 4G, but the demand, the consumer demand for broadband continues to grow. And so today, over 50% of the mobile data traffic is offloaded to Wi-Fi, okay? And so the demand is there for even more and more uh, mobile broadband. So that's the first additional application. The second is 
termed here massive machine type communications, and this is where IoT fits in. So here we see many, many, many devices uh, in a potentially very small area. This is an expansion, if you will, of, of um, mobile network operators' use cases. IoT is somewhat limited in deployment today. We've seen the LTEU um, narrowband applications such as Sierra Wireless. Those are in the early stages, and so many operators view this as a new use case, a new source for revenue for themselves. Uh, we'll see how that plays out. Um, the third piece is ultra-reliable and low-latency communications, is, and this is another uh, IoT-type application where you require high, both high mobility and, high lo, uh, and very low latency. So these are the use cases, and you can see that these are very broad. Okay, Everything from multi-gigabit throughput, at least one gigabit throughput, to very um, low throughputs, but very, very power efficient. Uh, applications. So the range of applications has has really broadened tremendously from 4G to 5G. So how is this going to be accomplished? Um, this slide, my bottom line here is that 802.11 and Wi-Fi technologies in this 5G architecture are, uh, 802.11 is a peer radio access technology in 5G. So here I don't think I have a pointer, but you can see, uh, starting from the top down, you have the control plane interfaces, so basically the network, the cellular network, and on the bottom line you see multiple radio interfaces. So the traditional cellular LTE evolution, new radio, new bands, you see a lot of references to 28 gigahertz, and even higher bands for fixed wireless, high bandwidth, uh, uh, links, and one of those components is our LAN, radio LAN, or wireless area networks, which is where 802.11 plays. Uh, reinforcing that here, uh, we'll look first at the picture on your right, where we see the some examples of 802.11 technology currently under development that we see, or I see, as meeting some of those use cases that we saw in the previous slide. So 802.11 AX, this is an amendment that's currently under development focused on high bandwidth, or high throughput, and uh, high density applications. So for example, the, the uh, Shenzhen <laughs> metro station or Tokyo metro stations or you know where you have very very high density to more efficiently use the spectrum and we'll talk about some of the technologies that are involved there so there we're looking at the uh, the enhanced mobile broadband piece okay where that technology can help uh, the other piece is 802.11ah and 11ba 11AH is already published amendment, and it provides 802.11 technology in sub one gigahertz bands. So 900 megahertz in the US, 800 megahertz in Europe, additional bands in Asia, again, for longer range, lower throughput, but IoT type applications. This standard is approved, it's completed, uh, implementations are being developed, but it's not out in the marketplace yet. Uh, the other piece, .11ay and aj, um, how many people have heard of, y, of YGIG or 802.11ad? One hand, okay, two hands. So what is 11ad? 11ad is um, 60 gigahertz uh, operation. So traditional Wi-Fi operates in 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. The 60 gig band was initially uh, standardized in 11 AD uh, about five years ago. Those products are just now coming onto the market. Uh, the extension of, uh, uh, extension of new technologies into that band is being done in 11 AY. So you get even, the goal there is to have 20 gigabit throughput in a single cell, single base station, if you will, 
uh, or access point. So there again, uh, that will provide uh, enhanced mobile broadband uh, applications. So uh, the other points here, uh, today Wi-Fi carries most public and private internet traffic worldwide. There's some uh, interesting charts in the latest Cisco VNI uh, report that has that broken out by country, so it's very interesting to look at. Uh, as I mentioned, 5G radios will, will be, by definition, multi-radio technology. So you'll see, again, to fit that range of applications, multiple different radios, including 802.11 type radios. Um, and as a note, uh, today's three and four G networks use offload, right, offload to Wi-Fi and Wi-Fi calling. Those are two applications that are using 802.11 technologies today. Uh, I won't linger on this slide. These are some examples. I presume you'll get everyone will get copies of the slide slides. There's a lot of activity going on, uh, liaison activity, et cetera, between IEEE 802, 802.11, and 3GPP to support the integration of .11 technologies more seamlessly into the network infrastructure. Okay, uh, that was the medium. Um, length segment of my talk. So now we're going into the longer segment, which is going to become a medium le length segment because I think we're limited on time. So here I want to talk about some of the market drivers that we respond to in developing .11 technologies and some of them that are under development. And so there are basically four market drivers. And this is uh, you know, a speaker this morning mentioned the differences between different standardization activity or uh, standardization bodies. And in IEEE and IEEE 802, 802.11, these are market driven standards. So it's really industry that gathers rather than governments. So industry gathers and says, we want to jointly develop a standard for uh, a variety of purposes. And so Basically, industry comes together and says, okay, what are the market drivers? What technologies do we need to introduce? And so you'll see here demand for throughput, new usage models. Uh, sometimes it's new technical capabilities that improve the throughput performance, et cetera, of the technology. And then also changes to regulations. As new spectrum becomes available, as uh, requirements on spectrum change, that will drive standardization activity. One example, uh, .11 technology is today serving many high density applications. The goal of 11AX is to do this even more efficiently and to get even higher throughput in those venues. This is one example from uh, about a year and a half ago, a major sporting event in, uh, in uh, California where we saw over 10 terabytes of data during the several hours of the sporting event. And you can read the statistics there. Uh, it's very interesting that over time we've seen the characteristics of large venue data usage change. It used to be that the, the vast majority of data was downloaded, right, from the cloud down. Now there are peaks in time at these major sporting events or major um, concerts, if you, concerts or sporting events where the, you see equally as high peaks or even higher upload. Why might that be? Okay, what are people doing in that sporting event? Right, they're taking pictures of themselves there and putting them up on Facebook. <laughs> So, you know, you s the, the traffic patterns are changing, and so the technology needs to support that as well. This is an example in uh, New York City of uh, kiosks that they have for Wi-Fi. Another example. Um, th this is a list of all the 802.11 groups that are active. I'll highlight just two of them, 11AX, uh, High Efficiency Wireless LAN, and 11BA, uh, Wake Up Radio. So Wake Up Radio is interesting. This is a a technology to reduce the power consumption of .11 radios. 
And this technology will be applicable across all of the radio types, across bands. So whether it's 11B, 11G, 11N in 2.4, 11A, 11N, uh, sorry, 11A, 11N, or 11AC in 5 gigahertz, or the 60 gigahertz bands, you'll have very, very low power consumption of the radio. And this, is, this will become an important factor for IoT type applications. Uh, maybe one more, like communications, this is a topic interest group where we're looking at uh, potentially starting an activity looking at delivering data from fluorescent lights or from light, uh, light bulbs. And you can see where that might have applicability in a, a high data download situation, high density application. So we've talked about 11AX, uh, the, the technologies that are being uh, deployed there or integrated include Uplink MIMO and OFDMA. We're looking at improvements in both the time frequency domains as well as increased modulation uh, gains. And here, this is where technology advances, right? We saw beautiful pictures earlier of the miniaturization of the uh, density improvements in semiconductors and, and all of that. The same thing is happening in radio technology to be able to get even more and more performance. So we're able to take advantage of that. This is an example of OFDMA and, try, and basically becoming more efficient with uh, small amounts of data and reducing overhead. Uh, 11 AD uh, enhancements, so again, this is 60 gigahertz. If you looked at the right, the data rates, yes, it's still your right, um, the data rates that are possible here in 11 AD. So 11 AD goes up to basically eight gigabits. And the extensions will take that to 20, as I mentioned. Uh, 11 AY, that's the extensions. Uh, H, I mentioned. So. Uh, bottom line here, and this is the takeaway, bottom line takeaaway, is that I believe that 802.11 technology, 802.11 components are now and will be an important part of carrier deployments in the future. And as a note, this is really a significant change from 10 years ago when a carrier would not dream of using unlicensed spectrum, right? That was anathema to them. But what has changed? The demand for bandwidth from end users. Okay, then now we come to the very short <laughs> last portion of the presentation. If you're interested in learning more about 5G, I would refer you to the website that's here, 5g.ieee.org. I've talked mostly here about IEEE 802.11 initiatives, but at the IEEE, upper IEEE level, there's an initiative related to 5G. There's a lot of um, educational, very informative material at this website with more under development. So I would encourage you to look at that. And with that, my time is up. Thank you very much. Let me look at the whole network in a more holistic view. Um, actually, a lot of coincidence. Some of the slides that I actually present um, in a different format actually kind of like resonates with what Dorothy actually you presents in looking at how the matrix and how the service is going to be perform, proposed in the, in the future. But before I start my slide, um, I actually was in London just uh, around three weeks ago joining a Rugby conference on wireless technology. And in that conference, uh, one thing that actually is, is resonates me is that when you actually start going to Mobile World Congress um, two years ago, um, I've been there since uh, it was in Cannes. So I've been, I, go, I went there every year since 1998, except the year when my daughter was born. And two years ago, you start to find out Oral-B is there, Ford is there, Voro is there. So it's a wireless technology conference. Why all these consumer goods are there? And then it resonates now in which last couple of weeks ago in London in Rockwood conference, they actually interviewed uh, one of the presenters, it's all moderation, there's no presentation. One of the interviews is actually to the British Airways CEO and also the, uni, uh, the CEO of Unilever. One thing is actually very interesting that the CEO of Unilever actually said is that, actually when we sell head and shoulders, um, 
50% of the demographics are people who actually is older than 50 years old that die by head and shoulder. And he is sure that 100% of the people can read the, the words on the bottle. So why are the words on the bottle? They actually should do different things so that people can read it and provide a different experience of their products instead of just putting in the supermarket and let you choose. And it's the same for the BA guy. The British Airways CEO is saying, like, imagine we actually just an airline company and uh, that's the time when the, the dude would drag out on United. And he's saying, actually, this can be avoided very easily that, when that you can actually let people know that the flight is overbooked and let people choose to take a next flight before they even go to the airport. How? By technology. So at the end, what I want to try to say is that nowadays, with IoT and with all these things coming, Every single company is a technology company. The CEO of Bank of America says that they are a technology company. Everybody is a technology, and this is actually very important to the future of our life. So I'll start off one slide first saying, we all talk about IoT, IoT today. We talk about, oh, how is the refrigerator connected to the network, and why is a wireless SIM, or is 802.11 the technology for 5G? At the end of the day, all these things winds up to one thing is that we all talk about not just IoT or a wireless technology. We talk about the smart city. And smart cities require smart connectivity. And smart connectivities requires a very good wireless network. And with our wireless network, there's no smart city. So with that being said, well, let's look at the wireless, tech, wireless network in the past and wireless network for the future. This is actually very important because in the past, what is wireless network? If you look in the, live in the US, you actually know, see is this commercial all the time of Verizon with this guy coming out saying, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? It's actually the past. It's really weird. If you look at it, Verizon bought Yahoo. There are a lot of activities that's going on in which the traditional mobile operators are reinventing themselves. And that actually is part of the move to become more of like more connected. So what we're seeing is that with also the unlicensed spectrum being also something that will be adopted for, with the, for, by the operators, as what Doris mentioned, the mobile operators is no longer the sole provider of the wireless network moving forward. We're seeing more and more increasing activities from our side of building owners, enterprise, municipalities, and government that is actually involved in the wireless industry and reshaping how the smart city is going to be. And this is actually one thing that's very important and honestly in Hong Kong is very, very backward in which the government is very much trying to be hands off of these things. I own a Tesla. Okay, one of the things that I receive on my update is that, oh, in Hong Kong, we are the only city in the world that demand Tesla of taking out the calendar out of the software of the Tesla car because it's distracting the driver. For God's sake, this calendar is not going to be used for this. They don't even see. I wrote an email to Nick Young. Uh, well, you can imagine what happened. Okay, they are putting a calendar there as a big data, they want to collect where people are going so that they can, pre you as a government should think out of the box and look and say, hey, I should access this data for calendar so that I know where the custom, uh, my, my, my citizens are going and how to plan the traffic flow at peak hours. That's what they are going to do for connected cars in the future for autonomous car. That's what's going on. We have to think out of the box. So a lot of cities are looking at providing different solutions like 802.11, uh, uh, unlicensed LTE services, and a lot of places are doing this. We actually, I was in DC after London. I walk up to an Avalon apartment. I don't know if you know Avalon. Avalon was one of the major developer of an apartment complexes in the US. And we actually selling a complete wireless solution to them so they install as a value added service for the tenants. We also sell public safety solution after like 9-11 to these building owners because they are mandated to put wireless network in the building now for themselves to operate. So the whole landscape is changing in the wireless network. So this is just addressing what I'm trying to say now. I'll just skip it very quickly is that in the past, it's just can you hear me now? To nowadays, we would look at YouTube, VChat, WhatsApp. To in the future, what is the future? 
This is actually the data that we collected. In 2021, it's been 49 exabytes of data. But what is the connected device? The market is converging. And it's no longer going to be with you. Actually, look at this. PC and tablets or handphones. These are actually going to be not much growth moving forward. You can see the compound average growth rate of 0 to 3%. It's going to be our refrigerator. A lot of different things is connected. And a lot of them are balanced with the wide area IoT or the short range IoT. But it doesn't matter. It's going to be our trash can. It's going to be our refrigerator. It's going to be our TV. It's going to be cars, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we see one thing in the US, which is more forward in this industry, is that there's a rise of an enterprise-led mobile infrastructure. This is actually something that we saw as actually a, a report coming from wireless experts in the Silicon Valley, in which they're seeing a new $3 billion market in which private enterprises and governments are investing and building new wireless network, while AT&T and Verizon, Sprint and Air, T-Mobile are stepping back as from being a pipe builder to now building the main network for low latency, but letting companies and government build their extension network in the building and et cetera. So we see that network will be evolutionary moving forward from the left, which is more of like a conservative top-down approach, building base stations, to now going into mobile edge computing, enterprise land, cloud computing, network function virtualization, et cetera, et cetera, with big data and analytics and monetization. So this is a slide that I think is very interesting. Is this is the future of the wireless industry. It's not going to be a point-to-point -point thing. There will be mobile network. But the future is just not mobile anymore. It's also wireless network. Nobody is big enough to actually do, does, does everything. I was, before DC, I was in Dallas joining an Ericsson strategic partner conference. And in the experience center, Actually, there is a MIMO antenna of ours, and they're showing something that's similar to the guy, actually Robert Burton, of uh, what Lee and Fong mentioned. There actually is a complete sensor-built ski jacket and a snowboard that has all sensors. So what happened is that if you actually build a complete, seamless, ubiquitous wireless network, you'll be able to receive all the data and you'll be able to analyze the form, functions, and speed of all the ski, skiers. They also have monitoring for all the NASCAR drivers, so they know when the car will fail and pull them into the pit stop and repair before it actually happens. So all these things happen that requires carrier-grade network with low latency, enterprise-grade net network like maybe using 802.11 or wireless unlicensed spectrum, or urban front end. So it actually creates a matrix of different applications like IOPT, narrowband IoT, connected cars that require low latency with multi-tier of services that address this need. And that actually is also going to be the future with both wireless, wired, fixed line, all these mixed up together with high-speed unlicensed and licensed network that integrates together to provide a future wireless network. And that is the foundation that you need in order to build a smart city, and enable an IoT moving forward. So we see this happening, and we're excited about it. Um, you may not know what we do, and I'm not going to explain what Comba does, and you can look up on the internet. There are a lot of network function virtualization. The enterprise is driving two total, total solutions. The internet, uh, the internet industry norm is coming to the wireless industry. We see Google and Facebook also doing all these things. One of our 2G GSM um, small cell is partnering with the Facebook for the third world country for connectivity. And we see mobile edge computing coming in to be able to provide even higher speed, low latency services for some critical demand venue-specific services. So this is going to facilitate the future with all the new standard coming in and with all the new technology coming in. But one thing is important. A mobile operator built mobile network will not be just enough for the future smart city. And there will be a, there's a chance and opportunity for companies that are traditionally non-technology to become a technology company and for even landlords 
enterprise owners to be able to contribute to this industry and build the smart city and the connected enterprise moving forward. So this is the last slide about Comba. I want to talk about it. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the uh, fruitful information provided by Pierre, Dorothy, and Simon. Um, we have about 10 minutes to take questions from the audience. Um, please feel free to ask any question to our experts. No? So, so sorry for questions. <laughs> I have one, actually, I, I started. So maybe the question may go to uh, Dorothy. And uh, since the, um, uh, I, I believe this is a question for a lot of, from, from a lot of people in the mind that whether AO2.11 is competing with 5G standard or is it complementing? I mean, if it's complementary, so which part of the network will be complementary? And which part are maybe competing? Complementary, uh, as the, uh, as Simon said, if you look at the, <laughs> yeah, so it's, uh, there's so many applications in 5G and so many uh, different needs that one technology, one radio technology will not serve the purpose. So uh, the goal, our goal in 802.11 standards development is to continue to evolve our standards to be more efficient, uh, providing more bandwidth to be lower cost and lower power consumption so that those technologies can be on the table for product developers and others who want to use them to innovate. Uh, because as we, uh, several people have mentioned over the course of the day, what is this really about? It's really about helping the consumer. It's about, as the IEEE uh, logo, uh, our uh, motto is, you know, developing technology for the benefit of humanity. And really, when I look at dot eleven over its history, no one could have possibly imagined uh, the uses to which it has been put. And one of the reasons why I think that's happened is it's uh, it uses unlicensed spectrum. And so, what does it do? It puts technology, radio technology, wireless technology, in the hands of everyday people to innovate. Businesses, entrepreneurs, developers, to innovate and develop. And that's what we want to continue to do. So all of the applications where Dot 11 plays today, we want to continue to play there and have it be an option, and as well as to move into new areas. Um, the reason I say, and I'm sorry for the long-winded answer, but the reason I say complementary is because we need our mobile networks, okay? If you're driving from I would drive from Chicago to New York, okay? I will not have a Wi-Fi connection that entire journey. I will when I stop at all the rest stops, okay? I will when I stop and visit my relatives. But when I'm driving on the road, no. And I need that, that connection then. So the, uh, the networks really are complementary, and we need them both. Thank you. I think I have a question from that gentleman. Hi, I'm Andy Lowe. I come from Richardson RPD. Just one question for all of you. Um, how do you see the security and personality for this so-called 5G Wi-Fi in application? I mean, security and personalities. Security. Topic security again. and personality? Yeah. I'm not sure I know what you mean by personality. Okay. Uh, but. Oh, okay, identity. let me elaborate it more. So, for example, you get a big data, you have my data. When I buy anything through this uh, so-called, uh, you know, the IoT stuff, you have my data, right? You know what I'm buying, you know what color I, I lead it. So this is personality. How do you uh, protect my personalities? Okay. okay. So is there any standard that they're protecting, I mean, the internet IoT security, like the, the cartoon that uh, Steve bring out this morning, Internet of Ransomware? And uh, more probably, the, your, your refrigerator will, will haunt you if you know, don't pay ransom, we don't open for you for food. So how, yeah. how is that any standard that being developed for uh, uh, IoT security? Uh, that was a great graphic, by the way. I, I have to pass that around. But, uh, so the, 
the concerns about privacy and use of data to uh, track people, monitor people, et cetera, those concerns exist today with our existing systems, right? In China, you have the Great Firewall, right? It connects all kind of data um, on everything people are doing, right? You worry about the vendors or the people you buy products from, whether it's uh, Amazon or Google or um, you know any other vendor. You know, you go to Macy's or whatever. They're collecting data on you. So I think the I, uh, IoT and these new ways to access or get information from people just exacerbate or grow the problems that we currently have. Uh, there is work going on related to privacy, related to standards for privacy. There's work going on. I know there are a couple of IEEE standards in that area that are underway. There may be some in ISO as well, uh, especially in the EU. Uh, there are privacy requirements on what can be done with data, where data can be stored. So I think that coupled with um, the uh, wanna cry type uh, attacks really raise the awareness of people that you know these systems need to be secured, and it's a it's a wake up call really to dev the developers and the manufacturers of these devices to make sure that you know you are up to date with the latest software, you're doing secure you're designing in security into these devices, and I think you'll see requirements on software development for security coming down the road. So I think as a, as a general industry, we have to step up our game there. I think, I think if you're concerned now, it actually is happening already. Um, there's one discussion that you can see, Facebook and Google are taking all your personal information for advertising, right? There's a question that uh, I've been to a conference and asked the Europe Google CEO is that, hey, are you guys, your motto as a company is now using that as to sell advertising. Yeah, you are an ad company or are you actually for the good of the mankind? So all, he knows when you go to, Google knows when you go to bed, Google knows when you wake up, where you're going. It's just that there's a fine line in which the current privacy, like if you see our demo outside, if you actually turn on 128 dots facial recognition, they don't know who you are, but they can remember you they can quite accurately know next time you show up with this 128 point fingerprint that knows you. It's just that how much you are stored. And there are actually laws right now that allows you and not allows you to, do, to store certain things. You probably need to be scrutinized more as the technology grows, but current there are laws, privacy laws, that mandate something that can happen and something you cannot do. And people are trying to adhere to that standard. Definitely, that company is not, not following it, but that's what's going on right now. Any question, more question from the audience? No, don't be feel shy. Um, if not, actually I have a question for Simon. Um, how do you compete with other market leaders, like a Huawei on a wireless technology or solution, or are you competing with them or working with them? Uh, I think, as I actually mentioned, I didn't put a lot of emphasis on it. Like, what do we do? Like, if you look at local Hong Kong locally, the high-speed rail network right now from 2 to 3 to 4G to Wi-Fi is all our solutions. Southern Hong MTL line to a lot of uh, casinos in Macau, they're all our solutions that we provide a complete 2 to 2, 3, 4G to Wi-Fi, the World Cup stadiums. So. But one thing that I want to point out is that the, the, the market is so big now that nobody can do everything themselves. And you look at Ericsson and Huawei, um, or even Hewitt Packet, I think one of the main business that they do is providing a total solution. And I don't know about Hewitt Packet, but um, well, Ericsson and, um, and Huawei, these two companies, 60% uh, of their total revenue are products that they don't make. So customers are now requiring total solutions and then there are cooperations, partnership, and competition slash partnership. We work with all four companies. There are deals that we compete, like for example, uh, the Shatin Central line that we are 
bidding, we compete with Huawei, but there are other countries in which we work together because nobody has everything. So um, I think we have a unique space. Um, I have a v actually very similarized, similar slides as you on the World Cup Stadium for Wi-Fi in 2014, uh, in which we have like around 800 gigabyte of data now is going to one tera. So all these things, there are certain segment of business that I think uh, somebody is very good at, and we are going to continue doing it like that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I hope I answered the question. Okay, I, I asked the, ask the, I, I ask the last one. <laughs> And uh, uh, probably the question goes to Pierre on the, um, uh, again, uh, uh, another alphabet soup on the um, acronym of uh, narrowband IoT and uh, LPWAN and uh, all these, um, uh, we, we know that some company is uh, very strongly behind NB-IoT and uh, uh, are, they, are they competing or win which one will be eventually be the winner? What's your view, Pierre? They should be equal to TAR11, right? No, that's good. Well, I think that, uh, so first of all, NB-IoT is one of the three flavor, I would say, of uh, LPWA that 3GPP has standardized. So again, NB-IoT, LTE-CAT-M, and uh, ECGSM. Now, looking at uh, just NB-IoT and uh, LTE-CAT-M, there are a lot of, I would say, similarity. It's uh, It's basically leveraging the LTE network, I mean the existing network. Uh, it is, um, it is uh, supporting the internet protocol, it is uh, bidirectional, I mean there is a lot of communality. However, there are also a few differences. Differences in terms of data rights, uh, I mean uh, with, uh, with uh, LTE CAT M uh, you, will, uh, you will have uh, 300k, uh, I mean 300 thousand bit per second uh, on one side, 375 on the other side, and, uh, and uh, with NB-IoT you will have only uh, 63 uh, kilobit per second uh, for the uplink and uh, 28 kilobit per second for the downlink. So it's, it's really different. It's also very different if you need the full uh, mobility capability, you will choose LT4M because NB-IoT cannot support. Um, on the other hand, if uh, you are trying to transmit very small packet of data, very small quantity of data, let's say 200, uh, 200 bytes per day, that's really small. In that case, the uh, NB-IoT solution might be the, the best one from the, the power consumption standpoint. Uh, on the other hand, if uh, you have to transmit more than 1,000 bytes, uh, then you will choose LTE CAT M. So, bottom line, depending on the use case, you will choose one or the other. So, they are going to coexist. There is uh, probably also differences depending on the regions, depending on the context of the ne network. There are MNOs that want to, uh, to refarm some of the 2G network. Uh, for NB-IoT, you, you just need 200 kilohertz bandwidth, so you can leverage the refarming of the 2G network, while, uh, I mean, if you want to, to deploy the uh, LTE CATM, you are going to leverage the regular LTE network, and you need one, uh, more than one uh, um, uh, megahertz uh, bandwidth to, uh, to deploy. So, I mean, this is really going to coexist, and this is addressing different use cases. And uh, well, speaking about competition, I'm not sure. That's really different technologies, part of, uh, I would say, uh, this uh, really certain of the, the standard, and this is going to evolve further. And um, it has really pro and cons, and um, that's really uh, depending on use case. So in that case, in that case if, if I'm a device developer, probably we still need to do both for a period of time. Yeah, and actually the, the very first chipsets that are going to be released that have been designed for LPWA are going to support both. Mm -hmm. Now there is most probably a second generation chipset which is going to focus on one or the other, but a, a chipset which is capable to support 
LTE4M will be able to support NB-IoT. The, the other way around might not be the case. Okay, thank you. So, one last question from the gentleman on the back, in the back. Hello, uh, I'm Henry from Arrow. So, sorry that I came late, so I did not really pay attention too much about each topic of uh, the speakers. So after listening to some of your speeches, I realized you are all the experts in the wireless uh, technology. So I have a question which is related to the um, very hot topic R&D right now is about the MM wave, the high frequency uh, spectrum. Uh, because right now we're talking IoT, it's like small data, we can save energy, seems like we don't need this kind of high frequency transmission medium. I'm not sure whether in the IoT theory or from your expertise, this high frequency uh, channel or spectrum can be used for the IoT environment because you know it's not much interference and because of that you can transmit the, the data if, if with a very fast um, time and but maybe short distance. What do you think? Thanks. So you, you mean 24 gigahertz and above? Yes. A very good question. Um, my opinion is that most of the applications I've seen being discussed for millimeter wave are high bandwidth. So it's uh, for, for carriers, an alternate path to the home uh, to bypass cable, right? Uh, so it's last, last mile, last uh, 500 meters. Uh, in the dot 11 space, we're looking at eight gig, 20 gig, so it's really high bandwidth. That said, could you use it for IoT? You could. I suspect the cost profile is not going to be what you're looking for. We're currently doing. We're currently partnering with. Um, we're doing ourselves, and we also have partner projects with uh, some of the major core equipment vendor um, on 5G, and. Um, one of our main, like you know, if you look at the whole network, a lot of the traditional base station and things are going to be virtualized. So a lot of the products that is going to be staying is like the remote radio head and the antennas. We are the antenna expert. And one of the things that we are working very hard is uh, with one of the Scandinavian companies is actually we believe that the 5G is going to be in that frequency. Actually, what we believe, everybody believes, yeah. So it's at 28 or 30 gigahertz. So it's going to happen, like the 5G, you know, for you to have the gigabit per second data rate is going to be beamforming, it's going to be massive MIMO, it's going to be one of a kind, it's going to be silicon on antenna chips, it's going to be integrated. So it's going to happen. Uh, that's what 5G is going to be, and it, and uh, most people would believe, like what Darrell Dorothy says, which is actually a cable replacement at the beginning, you know, to provide very high-speed services. So is that going to be an IoT play, or is it going to be a beam, which is back in the late 90s, a uh, point-to-multi-point microwave business that's coming back into play? It's probably to be like that first at the beginning, but as the price point comes down, it will be more uh, commoditized. So, but that's going to be the, but, but we believe, uh, and we talked about it, we believe it's a multi-spectrum type of solutions. There will be these very low latency, extremely high speed services that, that will, people will need. We don't know what it is right now, other than people all talk about connected cars. I, I don't believe a car has to be connected to be able to drive, or else a lot of people would die. Uh, at the current wireless network quality right now, but certain new services will happen that nobody knows that will require these low latency ultra broadband services. And then there are certain 4G, 4.5G type services that will be addressing other IoT needs. So it's going to be a, a matrix solution moving forward. That's what we believe. Yeah. Okay, thank you all for your valuable time and hope you enjoy this section and find it inspiring. Thank you.